Hey, welcome to Open Life Online. Glad that you could join us still here in the uh, uh, studio of the Gathering Place. I've yet to build any walls to turn the frame around. We're gonna get there. We will get there as we venture towards the holiday season. But we're diving into uh, week four of our series, Live No Lies. And we would love to know that you're with us. If you could fill out the Connect card, that'd be amazing. While you're in there, if something's going on in your world, you need prayer for something, we would love to be praying with you. Uh, that would be our honor. So make sure that you say hello in the Connect card, throw a comment, throw a prayer request. We want our journey through life together, which is super valuable. Wait till we get to thought three. Uh, and then as well, follow along with the fill in, the quotes, the scriptures, uh, which there's a ton of today as usual. Uh, you can go back and reflect on during the course of the week and it'll actually help this go from an idea to a conviction by the way uh, you walk through this. And note at the end of the fill-in, we actually have a couple links. Uh, we have a link to the podcast, Live No Lies, uh, and then we as well have a link to if you wanted to go grab the book and read it. There's so much content in the book we have not even ventured to cover. Uh, but let's jump in. John 10:10. 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. What a promise. And we have powerful promises like this, like hope, like peace, like joy throughout Scripture as those who have faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. But there's a very real saboteur trying to still kill and destroy all this. These, uh, the early church fathers, you could say, uh, referred to these three enemies of the soul as the world, sinful society, the flesh, disordered desires, and the devil, deceptive ideas. And that's what we've been unpacking all three of these have dropped from the mindset, the conversation, the awareness of most of the Western culture. But the reality is the spirit realm, the enemies of our soul, our desires within that tempt us, all these are active today. We must be aware of them because we can battle this together and come out the victors and experience true life, peace of mind through growing relationship with Jesus. So we're inspired by the book John uh, Mark Comer wrote called Live No Lies and the scriptures that it sends you on a journey to unpack and, and, and it's been awesome to meditate on this with you. Listen to this passage that hits on all three of these enemies of the soul. Ephesians 2, one through three says, as for you, you were dead in your transgression, transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You hear all three enemies of the soul within that passage. But today we're looking at the enemy of our soul, the world, or in this passage, it said the ways of this world. The reality we're looking at is how this is interlinked with the others. And the way John Mark Comer writes it in, uh, the text says, deceitful ideas play to disordered desires are normalized in a sinful society, the world. Uh, and this final moment leading up to the cross in the gospels, we can see Jesus is just emotional, worn. He's in this moment of, of anguish, it says in Luke. Uh, he, he actually is praying in what appears to be sweat as if drips of blood are falling to the ground. He's in such anguish wrestling with the Father before he goes to the cross. And uh, the Gospels hit on this in, in multiple ways, but John points out and really dives into in John 17 what Jesus is praying for and what he's praying for is you and me. He's praying for believers. John 17, 13, he says, I'm coming to you now but I say these things while I am still in the world so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. 
I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. Jesus wasn't praying that we would uh, keep our faith to ourselves. Oh Lord, just help them keep their faith to themselves so they don't experience uh, persecution or disrupt anyone's truth, <laughs> right? Seems crazy. Uh, he didn't pray that we would elect all the Christians who think just like us so that we could create this false utopia of faith around us. Let's take the hill by force. That's not what he prayed. He didn't pray for the plans for a huge bunker so that all the followers of Jesus could seal it off and live holy and disrupted from the pains of the world around him. He actually just followed in the footsteps of his father, exactly what he said he would do, because he was obeying the father. He could only do what the father tells him to do. And what he does is he, he came in the flesh to take on the flesh. And now he's challenging us through prayer to the father to be protected so that we in the flesh could not be removed from the world, but be protected from it as we're in it that we would be sent into the world, taking up our cross daily. That's Jesus' heart, that's his prayer. Here's our big idea today. We have been sent into the world. We've been sent into the world, into the sinful society that will tempt, lure, uh, it'll try to lull us, to apathy and sleep in our faith, draw us towards uh, uh, lifestyles of sin. That's the world we're living in, susceptible to these enemies of the soul. And Jesus was praying we would be protected from that, but that we would not remove ourselves from it. Even though the world is filled with evil, playing to our sinful desires, Jesus sanctifies us by the truth and the word of God, which we have access to on our phone, in physical Bibles, all around us, that's here for us. We're sanctified by the truth. We have access to the truth so that we can be aware of the enemies of our soul around us and live out the ways of Jesus, even in sinful society, even in the world. In John 15, 18, it says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own, as it is. You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Interesting terminology there when he just prayed we would be in it, right? He continues, that is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching they will obey yours also. So we're chosen out of the world to be sent into the world while not being of the world. <laughs> what the world, right? Is it confusing yet? It's just really interesting to look at. Um, Dallas Willard said this in his book, Life Without Lack, our cultural and social practices are under the control of Satan and thus, opposed to God. Wow. So what is the world? The Greek word cosmos is what is translated to the world. It can mean earth or humanity, like all people, or um, uh, one of the lexicons says, a system of practices in our society based on secularism, humanism, and hedonism. Uh, or John Mark Comer just says straight out in the study guide of Live No uh, Lies, he says, the world can thus be defined as a system of ideas, values, morals, practices, and social norms 
that are integrated into the mainstream and eventually institutionalized in a culture that is corrupted by the twin sins of rebellion against God and the redefinition of good and evil. What is that? That's like a reflection of the, the fall of man, right? The garden, this rebellion, oh, I'm gonna do something I was told not to do so that I can know the difference between good and evil, these twin sins, if you would. So what do we know? What do we know about uh, the world or the enemy who is in control of the world? Uh, three thoughts for you today. And the first one is this, the world is the devil's domain. We have to be aware of that. First John 5, 19, we know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. Good news, welcome. <laughs> Isn't that just interesting? Uh, yeah, Dr. Kerry Bashir says, the world is Satan's domain where his authority and values reign, though his deception makes that hard to realize. If you are of the world, then it all seems right. Isn't that true? If, if you're of the world, you don't know, like, what am I compromising? I'm not compromising because you're not aware that you're called out potentially. First John 2.15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them for everything in the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Man, so we've got these challenges already in the passages we've read where we need to obey uh, Jesus' teachings. We're told here that we need to do the will of God. These are ways to overcome the world. We're getting these glimpses. Matthew 16, 26 says, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Uh, I was thinking about this in, in the realm of sports, if you would. And uh, the reality is we're playing an away game. Like we're not, we don't have home field turf. Although we pray, God, we want your will to be done uh, as it is in heaven on earth. We wanna bring heaven to earth through us as vessels of the Holy Spirit. The reality is this world is an away game. Like we're on the other team's field. And in sports, that means a disadvantage. That, that means that the noise uh, will benefit the opponent. The, the, the will of the crowd is going to be not our will because we're the away team. We're aliens in this world. Throughout scripture, it says this. But like any good team, uh, we will be victorious if we're on mission, if we're obeying what Jesus says, if we're doing the will of the Lord because God has power over all authorities that oppose us. Uh, with this mindset, I think it's futile, like it's a, a work of waste of our time to constantly attempt to turn the game into our home field. I see the, the Christian church consistently, globally, trying to force people to change from an away game to a home game. No, this is going to be a home turf. Uh, and oftentimes that means forcing people to not have a choice. And that is a challenge we're not challenged to do in scripture. Um, doesn't it drive you crazy when you go? Uh, I think the best illustration of this is Mariners games that I've seen. Uh, and it's usually Toronto. <laughs> okay, we're not far from Canada. So when Toronto's here, Canada comes down and buys up all the tickets and it feels Feels like you're at an away game, even though you're home. If you're at one of those, or New York or Boston, they just travel well, right? Uh, but it drives the home crowd nuts when you show up and the wrong colors are everywhere in the stadium. Sometimes it feels like that when we try to force biblical culture and values on secular society around us. And, uh, as the home team, we could be driven nuts. The home team for us is the church. Um, but this is the, the futile effort. <laughs> what we need to be doing is to be on mission with Jesus. We're supposed to be in the world, not of it. And we're not supposed to force the devil out of the world. That's God's 
thing. He's going to do that. He's going to throw the enemy in a lake of fire at the end. But right now, our job is to obey Jesus and do his will on earth as it is in heaven. He prayed we would be protected at the away game, if you would. Thought two, normal is the world's most powerful tactic. I mean, we just gotta be aware of normal. And it makes sense that the enemy would use the world to normalize the things that would still kill and destroy the fullness we have as followers of Jesus, the peace, the joy, the, uh, the contentment even, um, and, and this world is trying to just slightly get us to bend constantly, to grow numb to the things that are not of the Lord and just follow the flow of the world instead of sticking with the will of God and obeying Jesus' teachings. But what's normal? Like, there's no such as, like, how do you define normal? We're gonna try. I loved in the study guide of Live No Lies, uh, John Mark Comer asks, what's something you do that you consider normal, such as a habit or behavior that others have informed you is rather unique and not normal at all? So, I mean, boy, this might date me, but I double space after a period when I'm typing. That's how I was trained and my hand just goes tick, tick. It's just kind of how it happens. I'm not even conscious of it. I tithe 10% of my gross income and I have since I really surrendered my finances to the Lord as a 21 year old. Uh, I was in debt, God gave me freedom and I just really followed that biblical reality for my life. How about this? I tip 20%. And if the service is really bad, 18. I just, they're not intended to live on wage alone uh, as waiters. Oftentimes things aren't their fault, um, but be generous, right? Hey, here's one. I go to church every Sunday. I still would if I wasn't a pastor. Uh, I did before I was a pastor. I went to church. In fact, I went on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, worship practice Thursday, <laughs> just the realities of uh, being faithful. I, I, I don't swear or drink alcohol. And oftentimes I find out that's very abnormal. I think it's normal. Um, I RSVP for events. What? Are you crazy? Yeah, I'll hit yes, no, or Maybe, although maybe it's just like not RSVPing at all. So I usually will go yes or no. Uh, let your yes be yes and your no be no, scripture says. But I want to not take advantage of someone else's preparation or time. So I always RSVP. Uh, okay, but just as is super easy for anyone, I'm not at, like uh, numb to the temptations of the enemy. I give in, like there's, there's things that I need John 17 prayers over my life for like this. I tend to drive the average speed when I'm on a freeway. Posted speed limit might be 60, but if everybody's going ah, 70, 75, I may just be there with them. In fact, this is your pastor. Extend your hands and pray right now as I confess. The other day I was going to do a training for some university students at Central Washington University. And uh, I was heading over the pass and realized the average speed was kind of quick. I looked down at my speed limit and everybody was going 88, like lots, the whole flow of traffic. And I felt the conviction. I got in the right lane and slowed down. Thank you for praying for me. I was delivered in that moment. How about this one? I have used my parents' login to watch a basketball game on TV. I did it, I did it, I wanted to watch the Huskies play. And you, but culture would say, what's the big deal, right? But I'm, I'm like feeling all guilty. <laughs> okay, how about this one? I have stretched the truth towards my narrative before. Like to make whatever existed go towards my direction. Just think about how normal that is in the culture today, but yet are we telling the truth? You know, so we got to catch ourselves in that. What's, what's an example of that? You're like that. I don't understand what you're saying. 
this is how it used to play out. Not much now that I work at home, but oftentimes I would like, Dana would message, are you on your way home? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way home, which means, shoot, I didn't look down and see what time it is. I'm still in my office. I need to get out of my office and head home. Uh, yeah, I'm on my way right now. Um, oops, right? Have we all done that before? Think of this as I was dwelling on this. How much did Jesus' brothers just go nuts with him never sinning? He never told a little white lie or a fib or he never stretched the truth. Can you imagine the parents, how easy it was for Joseph and Mary just to, oh, who broke the chair? Jesus. <laughs> the brothers were like, he always tells the truth. You know, it would have just been crazy. I don't know, that's my mind. Have you heard, <laughs> changing subject, kind of, of social contagion theory? There's a bunch about it in the book that you could read deeply on, but it's behaviors, good or bad, spread through networks of family and friends and neighbors and cities in very similar ways to like a virus. Um, social contagion, contagion theory, one of the, the best examples of this is yawning. Did you do it? Uh, see, right? When, when, you, when somebody yawns in the room, it's so contagious for people to yawn. I, I remember taking a sales course when I was selling furniture back in the day and, and they taught you about body posturing and you mirror the posture of the person that you're dialoguing with. How often have you been in a room where somebody's having a conversation and, and they cross their arms? What do you find yourself doing? Cross your arms. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Somebody's doing this, talking to you. What do you find yourself doing? This. It's just, there's realities. If people are dressing a certain way, this happens in youth culture, obviously. Somebody starts wearing this type of shoes, everybody starts wearing this type of shoes. It just takes a 2% to move the whole. This is social contagion theory. So it's easy to see how this plays out in the world. Uh, reminds me of a couple quotes that I grew up with. One is, if you lay down with dogs, you wake up with fleas. Uh, how about this? Jeannie Mayo would say this all the time, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. They both come from scripture. First Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be misled, or as I said last week in the Sunday service, missled. I have no idea how I read that way out loud in front of everybody, but that's just a constant for me, hooked on phonics. Uh, here's the quote, bad company corrupts good character. Bad company corrupts good character. S social contagion. Reality is the world is going to try to pull and bend us towards what's considered normal. Uh, when we began pastoring, it was right in the middle of the purity movement in the, in the church, which now is looked at like really harshly. Uh, in order to help students resist falling prey to the world, the devil and his tactics, we would just try to encourage them to be completely set apart, pure, uh, without mixture of the world. Uh, and we would use fear, peer pressure, anything we could to get them to not be in a secular mindset, if you would. So I remember the big examples going to camp no secular music and you know so tape cassettes and cds dating myself again uh, but students would sneak them in they would burn copies of stuff and and so we would have cd burning parties sorry ozone uh, you know just the reality we would they would get caught they'd list you know some christian artists on the outside of it when, when you listen to it it was the world's music and so we would have a surrender it to the Lord party. How about this one? Uh, we had bathing suit rules that still exists today. But some of you that are older remember bathing suit rules. We had girls swim time and boys swim time at camp, you rebels. Uh, one of our first camps, I'll never forget. Dana, my wife, newly married, new youth pastors. We show up to camp. We're so excited to have all these kids at camp. And, and uh, all of a sudden, we just, there's a ruckus in the middle of the night and Dean is getting yelled at. We're like, what happened? Come to find out one of the girls who came to camp saw 
boys and girls swimming together in the same lake and some of them were wearing two pieces ah! right this moment of terror calling home you know like i am being subject to these animals who just want to stare at my flesh in the water you know and oh boy that was an eye-opening experience to how some just want to be hidden from the world in all ways shape or form and it's also a lesson on how culture shifts our standards and over time we end up not realizing where we're compromising it's kind of an illustration of both in good ways and in bad ways uh, we have to be constantly discerning the world is trying to normalize things around us we have to be aware of this tactic romans 12 2 says do not conform to the pattern of this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And we already know that we're to obey his teachings and do his will. So this is good instruction on how to step into that thought. Three, the church is a witness to the world. Like we gotta be aware that the world needs our light. Matthew 5, 14 says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. It gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. How will people know where to find the truth, how to step into God's will, how to obey Jesus if it's not displayed? And the church is the radiant example of Christ to the world. We need to be the church. Uh, if we want to learn how to live in the way of Jesus, we will have to pursue Jesus, not only for salvation, for the work he did on the cross or eternity through the work he did, resurrecting from the grave or freedom through the power of the Holy Spirit he gave us, uh, but we will have to trust Jesus' teachings and experience deep human flourishing through obedience to them. 1 Peter 2, 11 says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles, right? This is a way game. To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God in the day he visits us. Eugene Peterson says this in the message, Christian churches are not, as a rule, model communities of good behavior. They are rather places where human misbehavior is brought out in open, faced, and dealt with. We need to be there for one another as we take on the realities of the world and its influence on our lives. The very word church means those who are called out. So we're supposed to be called out, but not hidden, called out, radiant example. We need to live our lives in such a way that they could be witnessed. The church should be a thick web of inner dependent relationships, working out the way of Jesus together, becoming more pure and bright lights of truth for the world to clearly witness. Um, John Tyson says this, a Christian community in a web of sub, uh, sub wow, I can't even read this, a Christian community in a web of stubbornly loyal relationships knotted together in a living network of persons in a complex and challenging culture setting who are committed to practicing the way of Jesus together for the renewal of the world. We're here for the world, just not of the world. The church is our home field where we come together under the banner of Jesus. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments, every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. 
in a world where everyone is doing their own thing guided by their own truths. There are no universal morals or truths or guides. The idols of ideology are failing and felt by all. And I believe that means there's hope. The desired end of this world that's free to do whatever they desire to do and give into their feelings is collapsing. It's not working and people are looking for the truth. And you and I are the light on the hill to guide them to it. Sent into the world to live among the pagans, keeping our minds renewed by the spirit and the truth of the word of God obeying the teachings of, the teachings of Jesus and doing his will. Here's our action point. Live among the world obedient to Christ. We've got to be that light. Live among the world. We cannot afford to just go to church once a week uh, for 70 minutes and think we're going to make a difference in the world around us or live life to the full. We've got to be in relationship with Jesus consistently. Deceitful ideas are playing to disordered desires to normalize sinful society. 70 minutes a week ain't gonna defend us. <laughs> what if faithfulness, obedience to Jesus would become normal? Uh, what kind of power might that hold as a bright light in a dark world as we unite together and pursue him in this way? We are this light sent into the world. Not of it, but to make a difference in it. I want to pray for you. God, I thank you for your word. Your word is truth and it guides us so that we can obey it, so that we can discern what we're being forced to normalize around us and, and be set out, be a light so that we can guide people as they return to you. The world is returning to you in droves right now. They are understanding that the systems they created with the wisdom of the world is falling to uh, really lies, death, corruption. It's not the fruit they desired. And when they look around them, they see a light that they can go to and it's Jesus. So I pray that God, you would allow us to be recipients of this bold prayer of Jesus in John 17 that we see that we would be in the world, but not of it that you call us out and equip us so that we can obey you and we can do your will in the world, making deep impacts and difference so that people can live life and live it to the full. I give you praise for this challenge. I give you praise that we can follow you. I give you praise that we can share you with others uninhibited by the abnormalities we live out in a world that's trying to normalize the sinful desires. Uh, we just give you praise for your words. We're not unaware. We're very aware of these enemies of the soul. We get to of really combat them, be protected from them. And we give you praise for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, next week, we kind of give a glimpse over this, dive into some additional practices that might really guide us to own the victory over the enemies of the soul. Can't wait to be back with you. Bless you. And see you next Sunday. Well, I hope you were encouraged and challenged by today's message today. This is the last call for any uh, connect cards that you want to fill in with your prayer requests or to let us know this is your first time engaging with Open Life. As well, I just want to point you to the Open Life Church app so that you can know exactly what's happening here at Open Life on a week to week basis. We always update the events there. And so this is also the time where we talk about giving and your generosity to Open Life. We're so grateful for the generosity of so many that help us do what we do here as a church from a week to week basis. But we also, uh, as an organization, try to be strategically generous with those gifts by providing for needs that help people where they're hurting locally and globally in areas such as hunger, uh, education, foster care, relief work, justice for the oppressed, 
and reaching unreached demographics with the good news of Jesus. And so for the month of November, we're gonna continue our focus on hunger and focusing specifically on the community big give by giving the first 10% of every donation given to our general giving fund to go towards the food costs of the community big give. Last month we did the administrative costs so that every every person and organization that gives to the big give gives to the food and so this month we want to lead the way by also giving to those food costs. Each meal costs about $35 and that's a great deal when you consider all the things that make up that meal that are going to be delivered to 1,500 families this Thanksgiving. That cost, if you went there and bought those food, those food items, it would be about $80. And so we're, we're getting cheap prices for these things in order to bless as many people as possible. And we're so excited to be able to do that. Getting to be on the administrative side, I hear the stories, uh, you know, going back and forth with communication with those that are receiving meals. I hear stories about how much this means to them, knowing that they would have to go to the store and might not be able to afford some of these things because of the situations that they or their families are in. Uh, and it, and you, get to real, you get a real sense of why we do this and it's to bless our community with the love of Jesus and we're excited to do it. And we're also excited to lead the way by providing opportunities for our community to come together to serve on the 18th and be a part of this great event. So we're so excited and we're so grateful for your generosity. And what we wanna do is to, again, just consider, have you consider how many meals you would like to provide for families in our community. Think about how many, is it one? Are you gonna donate $35 to that? Is it two? Is it more than that? Think through what you, your family, maybe you wanna get creative and think about special ways that you can find this money to help bless families in our community. So with that, we thank you for that extra giving above and beyond your normal giving, but we also too wanna just say thank you for the continued consistent generosity that helps us do what we do here at Open Life. So thank you so much for that. This is the end of our service. We thank you so much for being with us, watching till the end. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you again next Sunday, wherever you're watching right now, or I wanna encourage you, come join us at the Bonnie Lake High School Performing Arts Center, where uh, we'll, we meet in person each week at 10 a.m. So hope you have a great week and we'll see you soon.